Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Panasonic Lumix S5, a mid-range full-frame mirrorless camera with 24 megapixels, built-in stabilization, twin card slots, a fully articulated touchscreen, and 10-bit 4K video up to 60p. Announced in September 2020, it costs £1,800 or $2,000 for the body alone, or in a kit with the Lumix 20-60mm zoom for two to 300 bucks more. It becomes the fourth model in Panasonic's full-frame Lumix S system and the most compact and affordable model to date, but don't let that fool you as some of the specs, especially for video, are comfortably beyond most rivals. In fact, as you'll learn, the S5 could be thought of as a full-frame GH5 or a mini S1H, making it a tempting option for pro videographers who can't stretch to that model or who want a B camera with matched footage. I got to shoot with a preview model for several weeks, although as a box sample running firmware 1.0 it's effectively final production and everything I'll show you in this review is reflective of the performance that you'll see from final models. Now there's lots to talk about so I've split this review into two parts. Part 1, which you're watching now, covers the physical design, the controls, composition and photo performance and this will allow part 2 to concentrate entirely on the movie side of the camera. If you're interested in using the S5 as a hybrid camera or even solely for video, be sure to watch both parts as I won't be repeating the physical and control side in the second part. Right, let's get on with it. Here's the Lumix S5 on the left, joined by the considerably heftier S1H on the right, representing the smallest and largest models in the Lumix S series. Measuring 133mm wide, 97mm tall and 82mm thick, the S5 is comfortably more compact than the S1H and at 714 grams, it's over 400 grams lighter too. In fact, the S5's size and weight is roughly the same as the Lumix GH5, despite having a sensor with four times the surface area. Although I should note that Sony's A7 bodies are a little smaller and lighter still. Now some of the bulk of the S1H on the right is down to its fan, vents and unique screen mechanism but as I found the S5 is quite capable of filming for a very long time without overheating issues despite its small size and lack of vents. From the rear the S5 shares a similar control layout to the higher end models in the range albeit without the backlit buttons so you're getting a large and tiltable rear thumb wheel, joystick, AF on button and a collar to adjust the AF mode and areas. All fell comfortably within reach of my thumb, including the upper control dial, even when operating the camera one-handed. From the top, the S5 lacks the upper information screen of its siblings and opts for a simpler layout that's not dissimilar to the Lumix G90 or G95, with a drive dial to the left and a non-lockable mode dial on the right, along with separate buttons for directly accessing the white balance, ISO sensitivity and exposure compensation, plus a large red movie record button. These and the front dial are also easily accessible by your index finger. So with three control dials, a bunch of dedicated buttons, drive dial and an AF joystick, the S5 provides direct and full control over pretty much every aspect of exposure, focus and drive mode without ever having to enter any menus. Despite its compact size, the S5 also sports a large, comfortable grip that's tall enough not to leave your little finger dangling off the end and with plenty of room to avoid pinching of your tips. In terms of build quality, the S5 is described as being dust and splash resistant, but falls short of the additional freeze-proof rating of the S1, S1R and S1H. As the most affordable model in the series, it's also unsurprising to find a lower resolution viewfinder in the S5 compared to its siblings. Panasonic's gone for a 2.36 million dot OLED panel with 0.74 times magnification, making it a little smaller and noticeably less detailed than the 5.76 million dot viewfinders in the S1, S1R and S1H. To be fair, the S5's viewfinder is still very usable and actually matches the resolution of the Sony a7 III and Canon RP, but those are older models, and in 2020 I'd really have preferred Panasonic to use, say, a 3.69 million dot panel as a minimum. Revealingly, Nikon's including one of those in its cheaper Z5, although it falls behind the S5 in some other aspects. Moving on to the display, the S5 is equipped with a side-hinged, fully articulated touchscreen, allowing you to flip it to face forward or back on itself for protection. Obviously, this is invaluable for one-person video shooters, but I also love them for comfortable composition at high or low angles in the tall portrait orientation. I realise some people prefer the speed and discretion of a vertically tilting screen, and the S1 also had a neat triaxial mechanism with some angling sideways, albeit not facing forward, but personally speaking I prefer a fully articulated screen, and the S5 joins a small club of full framers to offer one. Panasonic's touch interface remains one of the best around, you could of course move the AF area by touch and even pinch to adjust the size of the AF frame. 
You can tap your way through the quick queue menus while sliding through options along with navigating the main menu too. And in playback you can swipe between images and again pinch to zoom in and out. On the grip side of the camera you'll find twin SD memory card slots, although only the top slot 1 supports UHS-2 speeds. This leads to some labelling confusion with slot 1 labelled with 2 for speed, while slot 2 is labelled with 1 for speed. But it seems churlish to complain when the S5's modest burst speed doesn't overly tax the cards, and importantly it can happily record video in any format to both cards simultaneously, all the way up to 4K 60p, and that's a capability that's not available on the more expensive Canon EOS R5 and R6, unless you count the proxy option on the R5 when recording 8K RAW. Plus, I prefer having two SD slots versus the SD and XQD arrangement of the S1 and S1R. So thanks Panasonic for giving us the functionality and flexibility that counts in practice. Behind two large rubber flaps on the other side of the body are the ports. 3.5mm microphone and headphone jacks at the top and micro HDMI and USB-C at the bottom. The mic connection is highest and clears the screen, but the open flap will obstruct a small corner of the display. Panasonic really should have split this into two flaps, although a craft knife will resolve that. The USB-C port can be used to power or charge the camera and also supports tethering, including using the camera as a webcam. Meanwhile, the micro HDMI is an annoying downgrade for videographers from the full-size HDMI ports of the other S-bodies, although Canon's R5 and R6 are no different in this regard. Moving on to power, the S5's shorter height means it can't accommodate the large battery introduced for the first three Lumix S bodies, and instead employs a new DMW BLK22 pack. That's rated at 2200 mAh versus the 3050 mAh of the older one. But while it has roughly two thirds the charge, the actual battery life in the camera is similar to the earlier models, presumably due to less power hungry components. I know that high resolution viewfinder in the earlier models was more than a little peckish. So Panasonic's quoting 440 shots on the S5 with the screen, or 470 with the EVF, versus around 400 on the S1. I also managed almost 2 hours of 4K video on a single charge, even at 50p, and recording to both cards simultaneously. Tell you that, Canon. The Lumix S5 employs a 24 megapixel full frame sensor that, judging from the specs and performance, appears to be the same or at least very similar to the one that's in the S1H, giving it excellent low light and video performance. Like all S bodies to date, it's stabilised within the body, and I'll show you how well that works in just a moment. Meanwhile, the L mount lets you fit any compatible lens, including models from Panasonic, Sigma, and Leica, giving it access to a growing collection at a wide price range. From the image quality menus, you can select from three different photo resolutions for JPEG files at 24, 12 or 6 megapixels. You can choose between two levels of JPEG compression and accompany them with RAW files if desired, although there's no compressed RAW options on this camera, and neither is there support for HIF. There's six different aspect ratios, including two that are wider than normal, plus a bunch of framing guides too, from tall and narrow to extra wide. HLG is available for high dynamic range photos for display on compatible devices and you can record them in 4K or at the full resolution. The S5 also includes a high resolution mode that exploits the sensor shift stabilization to capture and generate a composite image in camera with a recorded resolution up to 96 megapixels. Now this is a tripod only mode although Panasonic has extended the longest exposure from the one second of earlier models to a more useful 8 seconds here. That's particularly handy if you're shooting products or archive photography at smaller apertures. To demonstrate the potential of the high resolution mode, here's a shot I took with the normal 24 megapixel single image using the 20 to 60 mm kit zoom from a tripod. When you zoom in, there's plenty of fine detail even from this affordable lens. Now for the high resolution version using the same settings. The S5 takes 8 shots in quick succession using the electronic shutter before combining them in camera into a single image in JPEG and or RAW formats. The entire process takes around 8 seconds although you will want to add the optional delay to avoid any shake as it will ignore the standard self timer. Taking a closer look at this version reveals notably finer details than the standard version. I wouldn't say there's 96 megapixels worth here and the lower cost lens is also a limiting factor here, but there's still a visible benefit to the high res version over the normal one. As before, there can be issues with subjects that move during the capture process and even though there are options to reduce this, I'd still recommend aiming for a composition with the minimum of movement. As such, it's best suited for archive, architecture or landscapes on still days. Here's a still life example, first with a single frame at the full 24 megapixels, and again using the Lumix S20-60. And now for the high resolution version using the 96 megapixel mode. 
Again, there's visibly more detail in the high-res version, although again, not as much as 96 megapixels worth. Either way, it can produce improved results with the right subject, and it's a useful feature that's lacking on most rival models. Like all Lumix S bodies to date, the S5 includes built-in sensor shift stabilization, or IBIS for short. Here's the view with the Lumix S 20-60, a lens that lacks its own optical stabilization and seen here without IBIS enabled. After entering the menus and activating stabilization, there's a dramatic improvement to the steadiness of the image. For me, IBIS is as beneficial during composition as it is for hand-holding video or slow shutter speeds, and it'll work with any lens you attach. Moving on to focus, the S5 sports decent object tracking that will identify and surround subjects with frames, starting with entire bodies from a distance before honing in on faces and eyes as they get closer. You can tap to choose the primary subject to focus on. If you prefer, you can use a variety of zoned or single AF areas and again tap to reposition if desired. Driving the lenses is Panasonic's DFD, a contrast based system which you can see here refocusing fairly confidently between the ornament and the lights behind it. Here's another single AF test proving DFD can certainly work quickly and without fuss. Now when evaluating or demonstrating DFD it's important not to use an external HDMI recorder as these can actually slow the system down so do bear that in mind when you're watching other reviews of Panasonic cameras. To show how it works in practice you really do need to film the viewfinder or the back of the screen as I'm doing here. So far DFD has done a good job in the single AF mode but what about continuous autofocus? In this test, I'm using the face, eye, body detection to track me as I move around the frame. If you watch the lights in the background, you'll notice them pulsing as the focus system quickly scans back and forth to keep me in sharp focus. It's a slightly odd experience if you're used to face detect autofocus systems, but the end result is that the subject for still photos is reliably kept in focus, and in my tests, it also worked equally well for faster moving subjects. Here it is again using the high speed burst option which, with continuous autofocus, live feedback and the mechanical shutter, works at a fairly modest 5 frames per second. It's firing in short bursts here to demonstrate the focusing reacquisition, and it's working pretty well delivering an almost perfect series of focused images, albeit again only at 5 frames per second. The Lumix 20-60mm was the only L mount lens I had at the time of testing, so it's not particularly demanding for sports, but nonetheless here's a quick sequence of cyclists approaching, where the camera identified the face and focused on the rider on every shot, albeit again only at top speed of 5 frames per second. If you want faster shooting with continuous autofocus from full frame at this price point, I'd go for a Sony A7 Mark III, but if the subject isn't moving back and forth too much, the Lumix has some alternative options for you to try. First, in single AF mode, the burst speed increases to 7 frames per second. I use this mode to capture this sequence of a block of wood being dropped into a basin. Now, 7 frames per second still falls below the fastest of its rivals, but the S5 also sports Panasonic's 4K and 6K photo modes, which exploit frame grabbing from video to deliver higher burst speeds. In 4K photo mode, you can shoot short bursts of video at 30 or 60 frames per second before then grabbing 8 megapixel JPEG stills from them in playback while the 6K mode operates at 30 frames per second only, but allows 18 megapixel JPEGs to be generated, and that could be detailed enough for you. Both 4K and 6K photo modes incur a crop, and are slower to focus though, so are best suited to subjects that don't move towards or away from you. Here's an example I shot using the 6K photo mode with pre-burst enabled. This keeps the last seconds worth of action in a rolling buffer while you keep the shutter button half pressed. Once you've fully pushed down, the camera records that buffered second, plus one more, giving you 30 frames before and 30 after the moment you press the shutter. In playback, you can then shuttle through the two seconds worth of action, with the number in the top indicating the frame. Zero is the point you press the shutter, which, for me, was too late to catch the moment the block hit the water. Plus numbers are pictures that occurred after the moment, but the clever part is effectively being able to rewind to the minus frames captured up to one second before you fully push down on the shutter. You can then just choose as many frames as you'd like to grab as 18 megapixel JPEGs. It's perfect for capturing moments like these, like, or say a bird taking flight, when you can't always be sure you'll push the button at the perfect moment. Pre-capture is also a rarity in the full frame market, so bonus points to Panasonic here. 4K and 6K photo can also be used in a post-focus mode which racks the focus during a brief clip in order to capture a sharp image at multiple distances. Then in playback you can just tap on the part of the image you'd like to be sharp and the camera will automatically find the right frame for you to grab, again as an 8 megapixel JPEG in 4K mode or 18 megapixels in 6K mode.
It's easy to forget that initial recording process and feel you're actually watching magic at work here. Moving on, the S5 offers a variety of shutter types from fully mechanical, electronic front curtain, fully electronic with or without noise reduction, or an auto option. Both the electronic and mechanical shutters share the same shutter speed range from 1 over 8000 to 60 seconds, you can directly access any of those, with bulb available for longer exposures, although there's no bulb timers. There is however an interval volumeter if you're into time lapse sequences, and there's also focus bracketing. To compare the shutter types, here's a burst that I took with the mechanical shutter while panning the camera, and as you'd expect, the tower and the buildings are upright. Now for the fully electronic version, panning at the same speed, where a relatively slow sensor readout has resulted in significant skewing due to rolling shutter. I'd only use the S5's electronic shutter when the subject or background are still, or when silence is paramount. Moving on to image quality at high sensitivities, I shot this still life image with the S5 at every ISO value from 100 to 51,200 ISO using the Lumix S2060 at 50mm f11. I shot in JPEG and RAW, but in the absence of RAW support from Adobe at the time I made this review, I'm comparing the JPEGs here. Let's take a closer look at each value starting at 100 ISO and ending at 51,200 ISO. Panasonic says the S5 has dual native ISO, just like the S1H, which means at a certain point the noise levels and dynamic range should improve. Unlike the S1H though, this switch happens automatically on the S5 and Panasonic isn't officially telling me where it happens, so you tell me if you can see it here. I couldn't. Either way, I'd say the images do look very clean and detailed up to 3200 ISO, remain very respectable at 6400 and 12800 ISO, and only really begin to suffer at 25600 and 51200 ISO, but even then, they still retain a good level of detail. Now for a bunch of still photos I took with a production level S5 running firmware 1.0 and fitted with the Lumix S 20-60mm zoom, all a JPEG straight out of camera, mostly using the standard profile. You've already seen the S5 can record a decent degree of detail and retain plenty of it even at high sensitivities. I was personally very happy with the output from the camera using the default settings, although they can certainly benefit from additional sharpening if you prefer crisper results. I was also very fond of the Lumix S 20-60mm zoom, which, despite being an entry-level model in the series, is actually one of the most compelling ranges around for general purpose use. Most so-called kit zooms will reach further at the long end, but none will zoom as wide as this one. The ability to capture a 20mm field of view on full frame is a genuine treat for wide angle fans, giving you the opportunity for dramatic landscapes and interiors, while the 60mm end is just about long enough for basic portraits. If you're interested to learn more about this lens, check out my earlier full review of it. The Lumix S5 is a very appealing mid-range full frame mirrorless camera that will finally give the Lumix S system, and L-mount in general, the attention it deserves. A competitive body price of £1800 or $2000 gets you a 24 megapixel full frame sensor with very clean results and an optional boost in detail with its high res composite mode. You get 4K up to 60p in 10 bit internal with features that will delight pro videographers. And you also get decent built in stabilisation, twin card slots, cunning 6K photo modes and a fully articulated touchscreen all packed into a weatherproof body that's much more compact than the first three Lumix S models. Plus for only 2 to 300 more you get the lovely 20 to 60 mil kit zoom with its wider than average coverage. What's not to like? The viewfinder panel at 2.36 million dots is looking a little low res for 2020, albeit comparable to similarly priced or cheaper full framers. The top shooting speed of 5 frames per second with continuous autofocus won't set the action world alight, but if the subject's roughly fixed in place, 6K photo gives you 18 megapixels at 30 frames per second. The switch to micro HDMI feels at odds to the otherwise pro video spec. There's only one card slot that will exploit UHS-2 speeds, but the modest burst speed means it's not a big issue, plus you do get to record video to both cards at the same time, a feature that still eludes Canon. As for autofocus, Panasonic's improved DFD to a point where it will satisfy many stills and video shooters, but if you want to keep a moving subject constantly sharp during video or vlogging, Sony and Canon still lead the pack. The S5 is also of course up against a lot of competition. While it's Panasonic's cheapest full frame today, it's nowhere near the cheapest full frame body on the market. Nikon's recent Z5 body costs $1399, while Canon's EOS RP sneaks in at just $999. Neither has uncropped 4K, but the RP remains a compelling alternative if you want full frame 1080p with excellent autofocus and can live without IBIS or twin card slots. 
For roughly the same money as the S5, you could alternatively go for the Sony a7 III, which, even several years after launch, remains a very well-rounded package, with more confident focusing during video and faster burst shooting with continuous AF. But the S5 retaliates with unlimited 4K up to 30p, cropped 4K at 60p, as well as 10-bit options and a fully articulated screen. It's certainly not a one-sided argument. Ultimately, the Lumix S5 may be the lowest price model in Panasonic's full-frame series to date, but arguably becomes its most compelling overall. For the money, you're getting a very capable camera for stills and especially for video. Some rivals may shoot faster with continuous autofocus or offer more detailed viewfinders, but the overall performance of the S5 is hard to beat at the price. Photographers will enjoy clean results at high ISOs, the chance to boost the resolution with an in-camera composite mode, along with the ability to grab 18 megapixel stills at 30 frames per second. Videographers will love unlimited and uncropped 4K up to 30p without overheating, the chance to film 4K 60p internally at 10-bit even if it's with an APS-C crop, the inclusion of a waveform monitor, full V-log and anamorphic modes, along with the promise of 5.9K RAW to an external recorder with a free firmware update by the end of 2020. Meanwhile, both groups will enjoy having IBIS, dual card slots, a fully articulated screen, and the option to bag the lovely Lumix S 20-60mm zoom at a low price in the bundle. Whether you call it a mini S1H or a full-frame GH5, the Lumix S5 is a lot of camera for the money and comes highly recommended. Right, that's it for this review, but if you're interested in using the S5 for video, and you should because it's really very good at it, be sure to check out my separate review of its movie capabilities. Okay, thanks for watching to the end of this video, and if you found any of it useful, please do give me a like and a follow, as it really does help my channel grow and keep producing content, plus it only takes you a moment, right? And as always, if I've saved you any money or helped you make a buying decision and you're feeling extra generous, you can tip me with a coffee donation or simply by treating yourself to a copy of my in-camera photography book or perhaps some Camera Labs merchandise like a t-shirt or a mug. There's links for all of this along with price checks for the S5 in the description and pinned comment. So thanks again, let me know what you think of the S5 in the comments and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.